Would you pray with me? Lord, as we come on this very special morning to celebrate this great victory, we ask, Lord, that the words of my mouth, the meditations and thoughts of all of our hearts and minds together would be pleasing and acceptable, Lord, in your sight. For, Lord, you're our rock, you're our redeemer. Amen. Well, having become a grandfather, have I mentioned that? Have I mentioned that I, that I have grandchildren now? Yeah, I've mentioned there's two of them right there. Uh, and the other one's in the child care. Uh, I may have mentioned that I became a grandfather a couple of years ago, and we now have three uh, grandchildren. And something about now having little kids again kind of takes you back to when your own adult children, when they were small, when they were little young preschoolers. It made me think about a story from, oh, at least 25 years ago, when our family, uh, my wife Janine and our three kids, we went to Seminole, Oklahoma, uh, to go to the Children's Museum there. And if you've never been there, it's a really cool Children's Museum. It's a great day trip to go there and see that Children's Museum. But we had gone to Seminole to the Children's Museum, and we were then leaving to go to McDonald's to get Happy Meals, and we're driving down one of the main streets of Seminole, when Lainey, my daughter, who's sitting right there, when she was like three years old, three or four years old, Lainey said, a gorilla! I just saw a gorilla! There's a gorilla! And he's going to get us! And she was in a panic about a gorilla. She said, there's a gorilla! He's waving his arms! He's mad! He's going to get us! And, of course, we said, now, Lainey, <laughs> there's no gorilla. It was, it was probably, maybe it was a big dog or just a really hairy man, or, um, or something. Uh, it's not a gorilla. Yes, she insisted. Yes, I saw a gorilla. No, honey. No, no. You didn't see a gorilla. That, 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 that's not right. You, you saw something else. No, it's, it's all right. So we get to McDonald's. Lainey's afraid to get out of the car because of the gorilla, because the gorilla might get us. And uh, we tried to coax her out of, of the car. And finally, Janine, my wife, who's very clever at these things, uh, she said, Lainey, we're safe because gorillas are afraid of daddy. So, uh, <laughs> you bet they are. <laughs> yeah, that step off. Anyway, so, so uh, she convinces Lainey that gorillas are afraid of me. So, you know, we get out of the car, we go to McDonald's, get the Happy Meals, do the whole thing. And now we're finished at McDonald's, so we're driving back the same street, going the opposite way. We're going down that same street, and what do we see? You got it, a gorilla. It was a full-sized mechanical gorilla right on the edge of the street, moving his arms up and down like that. A full-size mechanical gorilla waving his arms. He was in front of a muffler shop. And what gorillas have to do with selling mufflers, I'm not sure the connection there. Uh, but sure enough, there was this gorilla right in front of the, of the muffler shop that Lainey's the only one who'd seen it, and we hadn't seen it. Now, when she initially told us she saw a gorilla, we, of course, we thought, well, no, no, of course she didn't. She's, she's little... She's confused, you know, she's, she's hallucinating, she's dreaming. We, we didn't believe her because we thought, well, it, just, it can't be so. That can't be true. There can't be a gorilla out there. And we dismissed what she said, even though she saw exactly what she told us she saw. Now, think about how the disciples treated the women in the Easter story. Think about how the disciples treated the women who came running back from the garden tomb, these women who came running in breathless, and they began to pour out their story. The stone, it's been rolled away. And, and, and we went in, and the grave, he's not there. He, it's empty. And, and we saw these two men who were wearing these bright clothes, and, and they said that, that he was not there, that, that he was alive. And then we saw him. We saw the Lord. We saw Jesus. Jesus is alive. We saw him. We saw him. And the women told what they had seen. And here's the reaction of the disciples. Luke 24, 11. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. 
They didn't believe the women. Their words seemed to them like nonsense. Nonsense. The disciples dismissed the women's story. They said it was nonsense because the disciples knew what they had seen. The disciples knew what they had seen. They had seen just a few nights earlier on Thursday night. They'd seen Jesus taken into custody. They'd seen Jesus arrested in, in the middle of the night in, in the garden where they were all praying. They'd seen Judas, one of, one of them, a disciple like them. They'd seen Judas betray the master. <clears throat> They'd seen Judas kiss him as a way of indicating this is the man you need to take into custody. They'd seen Jesus arrested by the temple guard. Now they'd all fled into the night at that point. But they'd seen Jesus arrested. They knew what happened next. Peter, one of them, Simon Peter, followed at a safe distance all the way to the house of the high priest. He stood in the courtyard while inside the house there was a trial. Jesus was put on trial, an impromptu middle-of-the-night trial in front of the Jewish council, the Sanhedrin, where they peppered him with questions about what he had taught and what he had said. And Jesus refused to answer their questions. He stood silent. They slapped him. They spat on him. Finally, the high priest himself said, I command you in the name of the Blessed One of God to answer me, are you the Messiah? Are you the Son of the Blessed One? Are you the Messiah? And Jesus simply said, I am. And at that point, they slapped him and spat on him and said that he was a blasphemer worthy of death. At sunrise, they knew. The disciples knew Jesus had been taken to the governor's house, Pilate. They knew that Pilate had questioned him, found he was not the dangerous criminal that the Jewish authorities claimed him to be. They said, this man's a dangerous terrorist. He wants to overthrow the Roman government, all of which was lies. Pilate saw through the story, and yet they'd seen Pilate bring Jesus out on a balcony and say to the crowd, do you want me to release your king? And the crowd claimed, no, we want his death. Crucify him, the crowd chanted. They'd seen Pilate wash his hands and give the order for crucifixion. The disciples knew that Jesus had been sentenced to death. They'd seen Jesus be led through the streets carrying a cross. And when they got to the places of execution, we're not sure how many disciples actually witnessed the execution. We know John was there, one of the twelve, because the Bible said John was there caring for Jesus' own mother, Mary. As Mary, Jesus' mother, watched her son be killed. And John comforted her. John was an eyewitness to Jesus' death. John not only saw Jesus stretched out and pierced, he saw him pronounced dead. And the soldiers, just to make sure he wasn't just dead, but really dead, had put a spear into his, his side until blood and water poured out of his abdomen. He was definitely dead. He was wrapped in cloths. He was placed in a, a borrowed grave before the sun went down on Friday. The disciples knew all of that. They had witnessed that. The disciples knew what they knew. They saw what they saw. Therefore, they knew, because of what they'd seen, they knew that the women's story was nonsense. But the women kept sticking to their story. And all the women told it exactly the same way. They went early Sunday morning at sunrise with spices and oils to anoint his body, a ritual that they had not had time to perform on Friday. 
before the sun went down. They'd had to wait until after the Sabbath to go. They'd arrived early Sunday morning. When they got there, the guards posted at the garden were passed out. The stone was rolled away. The grave was empty. And two young men dressed in white clothing that seemed almost too white, whiter than any white clothes had a right to be, had said to them, why are you looking in a graveyard, in a place of the dead for someone who's alive? Why are you looking, why are you looking in a cemetery for somebody who's alive? He's not here. He's not here. He's risen. And in their awe, as they began to leave, Jesus himself was there. Jesus himself was there. That was the story they told. Even though the disciples thought that's impossible, they had to see for themselves. So Peter and John ran to the tomb to see if the women's story was at least partially true. They ran to check it out. They ran to the tomb. Luke 24, 12 says this. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself, what had happened? What happened? Sure enough, just like the women said, there was the stone rolled away, the tomb was empty, the burial cloths were there on the little shelf where the body had been, but no body, no Jesus. Peter and the others, what happened? What really happened? All day long, they debated, could, could this possibly be true? Well, of course not. Well, what do you think had really happened? And they, they puzzled and they wondered. And that night, they gathered again together to rehash it one more time. When suddenly, Jesus was in their midst. Jesus was in the room with them. Nobody saw him come in. He was just there. And they freaked out. Wouldn't you? Here's how Luke describes it. Luke 24, 36. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Shalom. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. In other words, they freaked out. And Jesus said to them, why are you troubled? Why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It's I myself. Touch me. Touch me and see. A ghost doesn't have flesh and blood, flesh and bones, as you've seen. And he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. I'm not a ghost. I'm real. I'm solid. And while they still didn't believe it, because of joy and amazement, he said to them, do you have anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Ghosts don't eat broiled fish. And they believed. Finally, they realized that everything the women had told them was true. Finally, they realized that the women knew what they were talking about. Finally, they realized that the women had seen what they saw. You know, it's kind of interesting that the whole story of Jesus starts with Mary having an angel tell her that she's going to bear the Messiah, even though she's a virgin, that this child will be the Messiah. And she goes to her fiancé, Joseph, and guess what? He doesn't believe her. He thinks she's committed adultery. He thinks she's cheated on him. He doesn't believe her until an angel tells Joseph, everything she told you is true. Everything she told you is true. And then the story, at the end of the story, the women come back and spread the news of the empty tomb, and the men there, they don't believe them until they see it with their own eyes. Maybe they should start believing the women. Now, let's be clear about what happened that day. Let's be clear about what happened on that first Easter. Because what happened on the first Easter is an event that impacted planet Earth more than any other event in human history. What happened on Easter Sunday 
was more significant than the discovery of fire, the invention of the wheel, the Magna Carta, the Declaration of Independence, the invention of the microchip or the smartphone, or any other turning point or great discovery or great event or great battle or great anything in human history. This day, the first Easter impacted life on planet Earth more than any other event. Because on that day, Jesus of Nazareth conquered death, beat death. He didn't cheat death. He didn't dodge death. He didn't delay death. The Bible doesn't describe a resuscitation. It describes a victory. Jesus wasn't patched up. He wasn't sewn up. He wasn't somehow, they didn't have a couple of electric paddles on his chest that made him sit up. No, he was dead. He was dead dead from 3 o'clock Friday on. He was dead. But then, then he rose. The Bible calls Jesus the firstborn from the dead. Easter is victory day, not just for Jesus of Nazareth. Easter is victory day because it changes how we view death. It changes how we think about death. Because when we think about death, well, medicine can delay it. Medicine delays death. Science has studied what happens when we die, the actual chemical reactions when we die. Science has studied death. History records the death of famous people. But only Jesus defeated it. (laughs) Only Jesus beat it. And how we think about death in the light of that impacts how we think about life. How we think about death also impacts how we live our lives. We're gathered here to celebrate a victory, to celebrate the victory of Jesus. Now, you know, we have friends. I have friends. I went to school with a lot of people who were atheists. When I was getting my master's in philosophy at OU, uh, I was the only person in the entire department who was a Christian except for one teacher. Everyone else was an atheist. We all probably have friends who were atheists. Atheists, you ask, you know, our atheist friends, well, how did we all get here? Well, it just happened. There was just this big bang, and then there was all this hydrogen molecules, and, and then somehow over billions of years, they, you know, became helium, and then more complicated elements, and then, you know, one day there was primordial soup, and somehow that soup became life, and a one in a trillion shot life just developed. You know, it's all just chance and luck and the right atoms bumping into each other in the right time and the right place. And we're the pinnacle of that life and, um, you know, we're biological creatures and everything we think about like love and hope and courage are just chemical reactions in our brain. And when our bodies wear out, that's it. We don't exist anymore. There's no soul, there's no spirit, there's nothing beyond the grave, this is it. That's the viewpoint, the worldview of an atheist. And if the atheist is right, if there is no spirit, no soul, nothing beyond this life, if we're just highly advanced creatures and everything we think and feel is just chemicals in our brain, then we're kind of wasting our time here this morning, folks. If there's no God, no resurrection, no heaven, no spirit, if that's all just an illusion, we're all kind of wasting our time. And that's not just me saying that, that's the Bible saying that. That's Paul, the apostle, saying that. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. There goes my job. Our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. If the dead are not raised, then Christ hasn't been raised either. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You're still in your sin. And those who've fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. 
Paul just says, if, if Easter didn't happen, we're a pretty pitiful bunch. But then in the next verse, he says this. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. Paul knew with every fiber of his being that Jesus was alive. He'd met him on the road to Damascus. He'd encountered the risen Christ. And because of that, Paul turned from being a persecutor and an enemy of faith, an enemy of Christ, to being a man willing to suffer every hardship and pain to proclaim the good news that Jesus came and lived and died and rose again. Paul knew it to be true with the very fiber of his being. But he said, the resurrection, what happened on that first Easter, is the linchpin, is the most crucial moment in human history. Because it tells us that this life is not the end. This is not all that there is. Because Jesus conquered death, and because he conquered it, we can too. We can too. Easter is the most significant event in human history. It's the biggest day of our calendar. You know, we've been thinking a lot over the last six weeks about Ukraine and Russia. Vladimir Putin claims that there, Ukraine is not even a country. So, of course, he's delusional about that. Ukraine has a rich history of centuries of the Ukrainian culture, the Ukrainian language. Ukraine as a people. Putin says, no, they're, they're, they've always been part of, of Russia. They've always just been a part of Russia. Well, Ukraine was a part of the Soviet Union from 1922 until 1991. For 69 years, Ukraine was a part of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, the USSR. There was hundreds of years before that that Ukraine was its own entity. But for those 69 years, Ukraine was a part of the Soviet Union. And shortly after Ukraine was absorbed into the Soviet Union in 1922, a communist leader named Nikolai Bukharin was dispatched from Moscow to Kiev. We used to say Kiev. Now the Ukrainians just say Kiev, the biggest city in Ukraine. Bukharin was dispatched from Moscow to Kiev to give a pro-communist lecture. So Nikolai Bukharin came to Kiev, Ukraine, from Moscow to address a mandatory audience there to give a pro-communism, anti-God, anti-Christian, anti-Jesus, anti-faith lecture. Attendance was mandatory. And oh, did I mention that it was on Easter Sunday? So the people who had no choice in the matter were there, and Bukharin got up, and for over an hour, he proclaimed the glories of communism and ridiculed Christianity, ridiculed Christians, ridiculed the church, ridiculed Jesus. He spoke of the glories of atheism and the foolishness of faith. And after what he thought was a brilliant lecture... Bukharin looked out across the Ukrainian people and said, any questions? And one old priest raised his hand and said, may I say something? Bukharin nodded. The old Ukrainian priest tottered up to the front, turned and faced the people sitting there, and in a loud, strong voice said, Christ is risen. And as one, the people stood and said, He is risen indeed. Nikolai Bukharin could not stop Easter. The Sanhedrin could not stop Easter. The Roman government could not stop Easter. Vladimir Putin cannot stop Easter. The grave could not stop Jesus from rising. 
So we sang at the beginning that first song written by none other than Charles Wesley, the brother of John Wesley, death in vain forbids him rise. In other words, you almost picture death going, oh, no, 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 this isn't supposed to happen. No, no, no. And Jesus says, you're defeated. For Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we get to celebrate the great victory today. The victory of life over death. The victory of love over hate. The victory of truth over lies. The victory of hope over despair. Thank you, Lord, that because you live, we can live. Thank you, Lord, that because you are alive, that we need not fear death, that we too can be victors, that we too, that we too have a hope beyond this life because of who you are and what you've done and who we are and whose we are. Thank you, Lord, for this victory day. Help us to celebrate it with thanksgiving and hope and love and celebration. Amen.